Jesus stood in front of the empty tomb, or of the tomb, rather, of his friend who had just died. And then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. That was crazy. It doesn't happen every day. His, head, his hands and feet were bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Let's rewind a little bit. I want you to hear a little bit of the backstory that led up to this event. Jesus was really good friends with three people, Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. So that this family, uh, were, they were close friends of Jesus. When he was traveling through town, he would stay with them. They would host dinners for him and, and for his other followers there. They, they were tight. They were good friends. And they were even more than just friends to Jesus. They were his followers, they, were, they believed in Jesus. They had put their faith in Jesus, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary together. Well, Jesus had been out of town. Jesus was often traveling and preaching and healing and just going around uh, doing God's work. And Jesus was out of town when Lazarus got sick, deathly sick, and he ended up dying. Well, Jesus got to the house four days later. And we, when he gets there, he, Martha comes out and meets him, and they, they start talking, and, and Martha was grieving. She was hurting. She was wishing Jesus had got there sooner, and they were having this sort of intense conversation, and then Jesus says something that I think she didn't expect. In John eleven twenty five 25 to 27, it's written down that Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. I just love that, that re repetition. Will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. And this is amazing. At this time, Jesus, you know, is still walking the earth, doing God's will. People are people not sure who he is. But Martha says, yes, Lord. She told him, I have always believed you are the Messiah. That means the, the anointed one of God, the, the promised one that had been prophesied would come to save the world. She said, I've always believed you are the Messiah, the son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Today I want to talk to you about the good news. Now, you might have heard the, the, the word good news. You might have heard another name that means the exact same thing, and that word is gospel. I want to talk to you about the gospel today, the good news. Gospel, just gospel, is good news about anything. Hey, I won the lottery. Gospel. Uh, hey, uh, my, my, my friend is no longer sick. Gospel, that's good news. But when we say the gospel, we're talking about a specific good news, the good news about Jesus. And there is one central promise right there in the middle of the good news, the gospel, and it's this. Eternal life is the free gift of God to anyone who believes in Jesus for it. That is the central, like if you just boil it down, the central promise of the good news is that eternal life is the free gift of God to anyone who believes in Jesus for it, for eternal life. In another place in the Bible, in John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For this is how God loved the world. How did God love the world? He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life that starts now and goes on eternally, forever. Eternal life is the free gift of God to anyone who believes in Jesus for it. And I want to just make this a little bit more personal because this is true. And this is the bottom line of this message. God will give you eternal life if you believe in Jesus for it. And that is good news. That's gospel. Well, why do you need eternal life anyway? Don't we all just go to heaven and become an angel after we die? I'm not sure where we got that idea, but 
That's not in the Bible. <laughs> Can anyone be sure you have eternal life? Actually, yeah. The, the one who wrote the Gospel of John said, I wrote all this down so that you could be sure you have eternal life if you put your faith in Jesus. Well, don't all dogs go to heaven? I think I they made a movie about it, so it must be true. God has given us his word, the Bible, to clear up any confusion. And so many times we're just guessing at what happens after life, uh, after this life. But we don't have to guess. It's written down right here. This takes away the, con the confusion. And I want you to know this. The Bible is not a book that tells us how we can earn our salvation. That is, that is a misconception. That is a misperception. That the people think the Bible is a book that tells us how, what we have to do to earn our salvation, but that is not what it says. This is a book that tells us what God did to earn our salvation. That's a very different thing, and it's a very important distinction. God created the first people, Adam and Eve, and since he made us, he made humanity, we belong to him. We belong to God. He is the creator. He is our creator. And we are accountable to him. And God knows how life is to be best lived. And so God shows you and shows me how to live your best life. And one of the things he does is he puts some boundaries in place so that you don't harm yourself, so you don't harm others. And that's a good thing. Heaven is a holy place. And God requires you and me to be holy just like he is holy. That is his requirement. And in fact, it's a prerequisite for heaven and eternal life. But the problem is when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, sin and shame entered the world. And now all humanity is infected with it. And we have a, just a really horrible but widespread uh, uh, illustration nowadays of what it would look like to have the whole world infected with something. And the whole world is infected with sin and shame. Just like I didn't do anything to become a U.S. citizen. I was just born here. We didn't have to do anything to be sinners. We were born there. Ever since sin came into the world, just each generation has passed it on. And so we are, we are actually born into this status of sinfulness. Uh, the Bible echoes this in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says, for everyone, someone say everyone. everyone. For everyone has sinned, we all, someone say all. all. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. So God's standard is perfection and holiness and purity, and we all fall short of that. What is sin? We just read, everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. What is sin? Sin is anything that you do that harms yourself. It's anything you do that harms others. It's anything that you allow to addict you or enslave you because you are giving that, that uh, submission and that authority in your life that belongs to God, you're giving it to another substance or thing or situation or habit that addicts you. Those are, those are sins. Sin is anything that separates you from a holy God, and we all were born in sin. Now, I got I, I to gotta say, I want to give you some props because most people do try really, really hard to not at least do the bad stuff, <laughs> like murder and stuff like that. Most people are trying to not do that. And so we, we can sometimes think, well, I, ha I haven't done that, so I'm not really a sinner. But if you've ever had one bad thought in your whole life, if you've ever done one bad thing, if you've ever said one bad word in your whole life that was a sin, you're a sinner, just like me, just like everyone around you in this room, in the world. Because none of us is without sin. Romans chapter 6 in the Bible, chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the wages or the penalty or the payback for sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Now just let that sink in for a minute because that does not sound like good news right now. In fact, it sounds pretty harsh if I could just be honest. 
that God would impose the death penalty for any and every sin. But God is not harsh. He is love. In in Psalm 103, another place in the Bible, verse 8, it says, The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. Well, how do we know that? If God has imposed the death penalty for every sin, how, how can we know that God is love and not harsh? Because even though we are sinners, we are the sinners, and the wages of sin is death, God sent Jesus Christ, his one and only son, to die for our sin on the cross. God provided a substitution for us. He knew the penalty was harsh, and so he said, I'm going to pay it for you. So it's as if God said, I made the rules. One sin equals death. You sinned. But I love you so much, I'm going to send Jesus Christ to die in your place so you don't have to. It was never God's plan that we die. Death wasn't even in his plan. And Jesus, God said, I'm going to send Jesus to die in your place. And that's what Jesus did. He came. He did that. He did. He paid the penalty for your sin, for my sin, with his death. Praise the Lord. And so that's why I can say God will give you eternal life if you believe in Jesus for it. Wow. That is good news. Well, thinking about Jesus' death, three days After Jesus died on the cross, he rose from the dead, but his friends didn't know it yet. And they they went to to Jesus' tomb, just like Jesus had been standing outside of Lazarus' tomb. Later, Jesus died on the cross, and his friends were standing outside of Jesus' tomb, the place where he was buried in the rock. And they found that the stone that had been covering the entrance was rolled away. Jesus' grave clothes and head, and head uh, covering were laid aside. They, they were set up, folded up, and the tomb was empty. Jesus was no longer there. And their friends then saw Jesus alive, alive again, back from the dead, risen, alive forevermore. And Jesus' resurrection proves that the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross for us, laying down his own life, that sacrifice was acceptable to God. And God said, yes, I accept that sacrifice for the whole world in their place. And how do I know that Ephesians in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 5 says, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were spiritually dead because of our sins, He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved, not by any good work or good deeds that you have done. Our salvation, your salvation, my salvation, comes from faith in Jesus Christ. So in the resurrection of Jesus, when Jesus came back to life, God put his stamp, paid in full. Right on that old statement of your sin and my sin. Paid in full. Jesus paid for it. Of course, you've got to accept that gift. You've got to accept that salvation. Accept his payment for your sins. Receive it for yourself as a free gift. And how do you do that? You do it by putting your faith in Jesus, by believing in him for eternal life. In John, in the Bible, in John chapter 1, verses uh, 12 and 13, it says, But to all, somebody say all. All. Here's the good news. To all who believed him and accepted him, accepted Jesus, he gave the right to become children of God. Anyone who does that, they are reborn. Not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Wow, even though all have sinned, even though none is holy enough to get to heaven, Jesus came and died, one man for all, that we could all be saved, and his holiness is given to us that we can go to heaven and have eternal life with him. Because it's not by our holiness, it is by his holiness 
that we accept into our lives. And now God the Father looks at your life. If you put your faith in Jesus, God the Father, put, he looks at your life through the filter of Jesus' holiness. And he goes, holy, 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 forgiven, forgiven. That's how he looks at us now. And that is awesome. I'm going to rewind one more time back to the story of Lazarus. So earlier, Jesus' friend Lazarus had died, and he was buried in a tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. And that was foreshadowing, if you know anything about great plots and what makes an engaging story, it's when you can see a hint of what's coming a little bit later. And Jesus gave us a hint when he went to Lazarus' tomb. It gave us a foreshadowing of Jesus' death and burial. And it's really interesting when you look in the gospel, the good news written by John, written down, the biography of Jesus' life written down by John in the Bible. He describes, he was, he was a close follower of Jesus, and he describes what Jesus was going through when he goes to Lazarus' tomb. Jesus felt very intense emotions as he approached that tomb of his friend. He felt deep anger. Sometimes we have this impression that Jesus is just sort of like a meek, mild guy who never gets angry. He did get angry at some stuff. Angry enough to, get a, to take out a whip and turn over some tables in the temple one time. Like he did get angry about some stuff, but he did not sin in that anger. And Lazarus died, and he is, he is mad because death was never God's plan. That, when God created the first people, his plan was they would just live, worship him, obey him, and I think live forever. That's the impression I get. And when they sinned, death and sin uh, came into this world. That was not God's plan. So from that time on, God said, I'm going to do something about that because I don't like death. God is the God of life, not the God of death. Uh, it, Jesus was also, John said, deeply troubled. The, 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 the word that is used there, he is just like in anguish. Like he, this, this is not good. As he saw the pain of all those friends, all those people that were gathered around the tomb, they were weeping, they were wailing, they were um, suffering in their hearts. And Jesus was just like, oh, he's just taking this all in and he just feels so ang such anguish about it. And then we know that Jesus felt the deepest sadness and grief. It's kind of a famous uh, verse in the Bible, the shortest verse, Jesus wept. This is when it happened. It was at Lazarus' tomb. Jesus wept. His friend died. That's sad. It's not how it's supposed to be. It's not how he wanted it to be. And then in the midst of all this, the weeping, the wailing, the anger, the anguish, the sadness, Jesus says, roll away that stone. Mm. Roll away that stone. And Martha, ever the practical one, she goes, well, Lord, it's been four days. He's going to stink. <laughs> Literally, that's what she said. And in John chapter 11, verse 40, this is what it said. Jesus responded, Martha, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a head cloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Foreshadowing what was going to happen a little bit later when Jesus rose from the dead. On this day, Lazarus was reborn physically. You can be reborn, born again spiritually today. This is your day. God will give you eternal life if you believe in Jesus for it. That is his promise. That is the good news. That is his promise of the gospel. So my question for you today is, will you believe it? Just that simple. Would you stand to your feet right where you are? And Stephen, would you just go let Kids Church know we're just about done? Would you bow your heads and pray with me? And if you're online, would you pray too? We're going to just make this a prayer time. And I, I'm going to pray first. Let's pray. Jesus, I just want to thank you so much for everything that you did for us. When we were all, as humanity, infected with sin... 
And there is only one rule, and that is the death penalty. You came and you said, I will take that death penalty. And even though by one man, Adam, sin entered the world, by you, one man, life and salvation and forgiveness and healing has come to the whole world. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you did. And we rejoice, and we're so glad that you rose again. Because just like Lazarus rising foreshadowed you, your rising foreshadows us. And Lord, as we put our faith in you, we have eternal life. Thank you, Jesus, for eternal life that starts now. Even when our body dies, we go and live with you forever. Thank you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. May we, your church, may we, your people, rejoice in this fact. May we celebrate this fact, Lord, in Jesus' name. And while you're still kind of in a posture of prayer, you don't have to close your eyes to pray, but I think it helps to, dis to shut out distraction. While you're still in a posture of prayer, I, I want to ask you to consider something for yourself. Have you believed in Jesus for eternal life? It's God's gift to you. He wants to give you this gift of eternal life. I mean, he paid for it with the highest price. And he wants you to have eternal life. But as I said earlier, you got to receive it. Have you received it? I want to give you an opportunity today. And more than an opportunity, I want to invite you. I want to urge you. I want to encourage you to ask God for eternal life and to receive it today. How do you do that? Well, simply turn away from your sin. We already talked about what sin is. Nobody wants that. Turn away from your sin. Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead. And when you do that, when you ask God for eternal life in this way, you will receive it. The answer is yes. And so I, I want to just encourage you today, and I want to ask you, would you like to receive it? What I'm actually giving you is an opportunity, an invitation to become Jesus' apprentice, to follow him, to believe in him, to get life from him. Would you like to do that today? If so, would you just raise your hand? Everyone's heads are bowed. And just let me know. And by raising your hand, you're saying, yeah, pastor, pray for me. I, I want life. I want eternal life. And online, I can't see you back to the, through the camera, but would you just raise your hand to God and he can see you. And I appreciate the hands that are raised. Yeah, I see, I see you guys. I'm, I'm so glad. That's awesome. This is, this is a good day. This is a powerful day when you are going to receive eternal life. So what I'd like to do is just encourage everybody to pray after me. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to coach you in a prayer. You don't have to pray exactly this way, but I just want to coach you, just kind of show you how. And you can pray right now. You can pray later as you, as you think about it and you think about God. You, you can pray this prayer and receive eternal life. Okay, let's do it together. Would you pray after me? Everybody together. Jesus, I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and let you lead. God, please give me eternal life. I believe in Jesus for it. And Lord, we just thank you that every time you, you uh, hear a prayer like that, every time you hear us pray, forgive me of my sins, make me new, give me eternal life, you give it, Lord. So Lord, right now, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you, Lord. We receive it. We receive that gift. We receive your life. We receive eternal life from you right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer today, some of you here in the room, some of you online prayed that prayer today, we just say welcome to the family of God, to the kingdom of God. I'm so glad that you made that decision. That is awesome. And it, it would help me if you just let me know that you made that decision. Would you take your smartphone out now while you're still thinking about it? And just text to that same phone number that we use. It's our texting number, 97000. Text the word RESTART restart because you're restarting your life spiritually with faith in God. Text that word restart to 97,000 and that will just let us know and I'd appreciate hearing about it. God bless you guys. Thank you, Pastor Garen. Oh, welcome to the family, guys. Good job. <laughs> well, hey, um, 
Anyone, so anyone who is serving in the fall festival, now is your cue to leave. Um, we're going to let you guys go a few minutes early, a few seconds early, just to, so you don't get trampled by the mob. Um, for everybody else, if you dropped off kids, so you are going to be, when I say go, you are going to be going to um, kids' church, picking up your kids, and then you are going to be following the arrows. So you're going to be making a cue, kind of slowly walking through our back hallways, following the arrows. This is just for everyone's safety um, because of COVID. Try and stay social distance. You know that you know the drill by this time. Um, so if you if you've dropped off kids before, it's a little different than normal. So do that. Also, stop by the photo booth on the way out. Take take a couple pictures and head on out to the fall festival. It's going to be such a blast, such a great time. And you guys are dismissed. You guys can head out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it was so good to see you guys this week. I will see you next week. God bless.